All right, so today's uh, today's lesson. So today's lesson is going to be on modeling terms. So these are terms that you guys are going to hear often in the modeling field. And uh, the more familiar you get with them, the more you'll understand uh, how this stuff works and the more you'll get comfortable whenever you encounter a problem and you don't know what to call it or you don't know what to say. So hopefully this demystifies uh, some of that stuff. So uh, the quicker I can get into this, the quicker I can get you guys out of here and you know for fyi this information is already on my youtube i'm going to repost this one but i you know i do it every semester so if i do any updates it's live and it's it's here for you guys but if you miss anything from this one or you want a refresher you can always go to previous uh classes that i have on youtube and you can check those out and those have this exact same uh modeling terms um you know spiel but glad you guys are here glad you guys can join me uh, let's uh, let's dive in. Okay, so as you see, there's no uh, there's no no board today because you don't need to see anything I'm doing on my keyboard. So uh, let's start with uh, this. So these are just basic uh, 3D modeling terms that you guys should know. Start familiarizing yourself with so that when you hear them, you're not confused. You're not you know like oh what should I say here? What, what's this supposed to be? You know exactly what it is. All right. So geometry. Geometry is just a simple term. It's a simple colloquial term that uh, refers to the th to the solid uh, 3D objects in a scene and the objects used to create them. They are known as geometry. Usually geometry comprises uh, the subject of your scene and the objects that you render. So, you know, geo is another term that you'll hear. So either geometry or geo, these are colloquial terms that we use inside of 3D modeling to refer to the objects and the things that you'll see inside your scene, mainly uh, the things that you either model, purchased, you know, things like that. That's the geo in the scene. Anything that's in geometry, you know, is essentially like triangles, polygons. So if you think about that, you know, in that term, it's a little easier. So when somebody says, hey, uh, you need to look at the geo in that object, well, you, they, they're saying you need to look at the geometry, what, you know, what comprises of it or that object right there. So. That's how um, that's how you guys can think about that. So geometry term you guys should uh, should definitely learn and know. All right. So basics of uh, creating and modifying objects. So to modify uh, the modify panel provides controls to complete the modeling process. You can rework any object from its creation uh, parameters to its internal geometry. Both object space and world space modifiers let you apply a wide range of effects to objects in your scene. The modifier stack allows editing of the modifier sequence. So um, if you go into your 3ds max and the scene you're going to see is is going to be you're going to have this create tab you're going to have this modify tab you're going to have a hierarchy tab you're going to have uh, the motion the display and finally your utilities in last class when i walked you through uh, 3ds max i showed you guys this is where your modifier list is going to be the hierarchy tab there you can change your uh, uh you know your uh, IK, FK, your locking and, and different things like that. So that's what those uh, those are for. So yeah, that's uh, your basic modifier tab. So the create panel is is that entire panel right here. This where it says plus. This is your create panel, right? It contains controls for creating new objects. The first step in building a scene. Despite the variety of object types, the creation process is consistent for most objects, right? What they say, when they say it's the same for most objects, remember last class I talked about, um, maybe it was a two classes ago, but I talked about how there's sometimes when you create something, it's a one step process. There's sometimes it's a two step. Th some objects even have three step processes. So that's three different clicks. So one time, if you're making a plane, you just click, boom and drag. You've created your plane, right? You're width and your length. Sometimes it might have three steps or two steps where you have to create the radius first, then the height, then if it's a cone, you got to create that cone shape to it, right? So there, some objects have more than one. So that's what they say. It's consistent for most objects. 
some of them it's one step, two step, three step creation processes. So, and that just means three different clicks that it takes for you to make the object. All right, so the viewport is the default 3ds Max view screen. You have four viewports to observe your model, and you can make four or two or three by one, or you know. And I showed you that the panel in that little corner where you can add different views to your uh, scene, and then you can switch back and forth between those views. So the top shelf has basic selection and object gizmos like your translate, your rotate, and your scale. And like I told you, those are mapped to W, E, and R keys on your keyboard. So holding on to these buttons will expand further options. For example, the scale tool will offer options for uniformly scaling your object or uh, scaling on different as, uh, axes. So holding down the marquee selection or the marquee button will offer other options from selecting like a square, a circle, uh, and even geometric, which is you can select different ones or you can even use a, a line. You can spray your selection. So there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, essentially skin a cat. I don't know why the people use that term, but you can skin a cat in a bunch of different ways. Um, so in the lower right corner, uh, if you ex yeah, is the expanded viewport button, which uh, whichever viewport is selected will maximize on the click of this button. So that's that. It's like a, it's called. I usually call it the view extent. So it, it, it maximizes that view. But remember, I told you there's a cool way to do it, and the cool way to do that is just hit Alt and W uh, at the same time. So then these are these are questions that you're gonna get. I'm gonna ask you, hey. The, the you know the expanded viewport button you can click it to uh, you know um, you can click it to maximize your viewport what's the hotkey for that right so that's something you're gonna have to think about is oh well, well what, what was the hotkey if you didn't watch the video if you didn't show up to the class you're gonna miss that question all right so let's uh, let's move on uh, let's see so here is the basic view that you would get whenever you open your 3ds max vanilla you haven't done any changes to it uh, and this is what I would call like a vanilla uh, kind of uh, 3ds max uh, screen so you've got your marquee options right up here where you can uh, have it selected uh, inbounds or out of bounds and you know that's that's another it's another topic it's just it's pretty it's pretty much that you just select you know anything inside or outside or and it'll exclude everything else and then the marquee selection if you hold that guy down whoops I didn't mean to click it. It's not an actual, it's not actual 3ds Max. So if you hold that down, that marquee selection, it'll drop down the list for you. And there'll be like a circle. There's a spray bottle. There's like a little zigzag, which is like a lasso. So you can like lasso it, uh, kind of you know like uh, a free lasso, like you would get inside of Photoshop, or uh, kind of like a rectangular lasso that does like a, a line. And then whenever you close that. Uh, dashed line or the, the dotted line it gives you that selection that you've uh, picked so translation uh, is right here you just click that and that's W on your keyboard and that you, you allows you to move around the map or move your object then you can rotate your object E and then R is scale right so these are you know in in my whenever I was at the school and I was you know teaching in person I would have my kids or my students I don't know they're not kids, they're grown people. So I'd have my students kind of just practice W E R W E R W E R. If you have a keyboard, just W E R W E R W E R. So just so it's all about muscle memory, guys. Like this stuff is all about muscle memory so that when you get it down, right, you'll be like, oh, okay, okay, W E R. You hit W, that's your move. E, uh, rotate, uh, R, scale, W E R. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, oops, oops. Boom, 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 like that. Like I'm just like that, right? And then your snaps, right? It's S and A for angle snaps. So S is snaps, and then A is for angle snaps. So S and A, S and A, S and A, right there. So all your hotkeys, they're around like the same, a similar, a similar, um, a similar location, right? And then the little teapot, right? You can, if you hit this guy, it'll bring up your your uh, render settings. You hit the render button, it'll. Uh, render the scene for you if you hit the one with the that's inside the, the the window box right that one opens up your last rendered scene so these are very simple things that you guys should have clicked 
understood or seen how it works and if you guys had any questions you guys can kind of bring it back to me all right so the next thing you guys should look right right here this is your viewport uh, your viewport options right here and it's on every single panel that you have open right so here if I wanted I can change this front view click it boom it'll drop something down and I can change it to whatever view I want I can change it to the back front you know so they give you this setup and then you can go in and change them to whatever you really want you can customize it however you feel uh, but this is where uh, stuff is and this is your create panel right here this is your create panel right so I might ask you on the quiz hey what are the first four things in the create panel right you gotta know that that's something that you should you should know you should you know where, where would I go to create a circle or a box right a primitive right so if you drop down this menu as well right you've got more than your standard primitives you got booleans you've got extended primitives right so you've got a lot of options in there that you guys should go in and explore yourselves but I'm just giving you guys an overall basics uh, of your interface and where to find these important things that you're gonna use all right so creating a primitive right uh, I just talked about that drop down menu where you have your standard primitives your extended primitives and, and different objects that you can create a your AEC extended your windows your doors your trees you can create a bunch of stuff in just this panel uh, alone and this is where you do most of your basic or your starter creation and then you augment it with modifiers and tools and different things like that so in the first tab of the command panel there are several options for primitive shape creation click the button of the shape you wish to create then drag it on the grid depending on the shape you will have to define certain parameters for a cube it is simply dragging the 2d square on the grid and then creating the height so uh, that might be worded a little weird because what essentially it's a two-step creation you, you create the base and then you create the height but whenever you're done with that you can go right into the modifier panel and then edit the uh, parameters that you already have on that cube or that box right 3ds max now gives you the option to make a cube which is uh, equilateral on all the sides it's an equal sided cube so no matter what size you create the sizes are going to be the same and it's just going to be a perfect uh, square perfect cube on all sides right so there's two different ones you can create now so there's a cube and then a box that you can create so and those uh, the, that's probably one of the only changes because I think this is pre uh, cube uh, that I have this all right so um, uh, let's see adjusting your parameters so when you go into that modifier panel you're gonna get you're gonna see something that looks like this where it goes you can have the you can drop down the keyboard entry and then you've got your parameters all right so these object parameters are very very important so once generated there are options to modify the primitive before beginning the model you can modify the height the width and the length if each set of the uh, of the same if each set to the same number it will give you an equal sided cube right but now they give they just give you an option to make a cube so the segments refer to how many edges uh, edge loops on which axis uh, will be added to the base cube so that those are the lines that run horizontally uh, horizontally and vertically along whatever shape you're making so if it's a cube you'll have some that go this way this way and then uh, the height segment so these these this will essentially give you more geo because you're dividing that mesh up into either equal parts of four or five you can even divide them into unequal parts if that's what you want right so that's the that's the idea of this these parameters and that's why I try to emphasize uh, not destructively modeling your objects because uh, what happens is sometimes you might want to go back and go I messed up I should have put 15 length segments and there are 16 width segments and there are 10 height segments right but now you can't go back and you're stuck into what it is uh, that you've put in there if you've collapsed everything into um, a th uh, editable poly so sometimes you don't want to collapse everything into the editable poly so that's uh, that's the idea of that all right so naming and color uh, so just above the parameter options is the naming and the color of the primitive naming it is important for keeping the objects in the scene organized especially when a model uh, or 
environment become more complex and consists of numerous objects. All right, Ex uh, changing the color of the object is purely preference. And I will say no to that because what happens is uh, you get these models that have these rainbow colored um, you know, assets in there. And I have the perfect example from my job, actually. Um, so we got this model, um, and this is this is just a pure, purely just to show you guys uh, what we got. So we got this model, and uh, we're supposed to, you know, fix it and do all this stuff and render it out or stuff. This is what I mean by object color. So you see this, like this is just it's all over the place and one of my coworkers saw it and kind of made you know made it made a joke of it as well as like oh look at this rainbow colored model we got and this isn't something we did internally this is something somebody sent us right so the idea is with all of these all of these now have these different colors right here and right here is where the color is and this is the naming convention so it's important what we usually do this is just a purely prior learning experience right here what we usually do is we select all the objects right select all the objects and give it one color and usually that color is black because what it does is it gives you a good outline right this is much more easier to visualize and see than this All right when it when it had all those multicolors and see if I can go back to the multicolor. So there we go. So that versus I've got another one open actually that they did the exact same thing on. So that versus this, right? It already makes it hard to see because they've got all these rainbow colors going on, right? It's harder for you to read that information and tell what's going on. But if you see something like this, okay, you know, those are parking spots, those are parking lines, that's a roof over there, that's the, you know, uh, site plan, that's, the, you know, it makes it just a little bit easier for you guys to see. And that's what's important. This, these are the little, little, little professional things that need to happen with your work for you guys to transition, right? When you send people your model, don't put a bunch of different colors in there. And this is not to bat, rag on it. This is just as an informational thing for you guys to give you guys a little heads up. Hey, whenever I'm, whenever you're done with all your models, because you might get hundreds and hundreds of pieces that make up your model, make it one color because that color affects the wire color. That wire color allows people to be able to see it better. So when somebody's judging it or about to use it, they have that just one simple color that they're dealing with and it doesn't bog down their machine if their their machine or their, their engine has to kind of figure out ever all these different colors and stuff. It, it doesn't take a lot of you know memory, but it's just one of those little things in professionalism and, and getting your stuff to be like 100% that really sets people apart in the industry, you know? You know, and, and it was one of those things that my, my coworker said, oh, look, we got another rainbow, you know, thing. So it's one of those things that people don't outwardly judge you on, but they think about it. And you don't want people to, you don't want people to even look away from your art or even give you one negative ding or anything for anything, right? It's already competitive, right? Give yourself the most advantage you can. And that's one way you can do that is just by making your colors uniform, something Something that stands out. Don't make it red. If you make it blue, all, everything blue, I'm cool. If you make everything green, I'm cool. If you make, just make it one, everything one color, right? And I feel it feels like I'm harping on something very that small, but little things like that, you know, it is the kind of thing that oh man, that guy's not he's not on his game or he's not he's not willing to put in that extra or he you know you don't want to give anybody anything to think about when it comes to this field. Right, because when they're thinking about that, they're thinking there's another guy who can do that, and you don't want to you don't want to put yourself in that situation. All right, so uh, let's move on to our shading options. So in the upper left corner of the viewport, there are the camera and shading options. Under shading options, there are several choices to assist while modeling, such as wireframe and flat shading. Uh, the option of edge faces allows the visibility of the wireframe on uh, on top of the model. So 
like I told you guys, there's, you know, if you drop those down, that's, you'll get these, the realistic, the shaded, the consistent color, the Edgewood frame, you know, now they've added like clay and different things like that. You want it to just memorize what those, um, what those hotkeys are, you know, F2, F3 and F4 or F3 and F4 for your shaded view and then your edged faces view, those really, really speed up your workflow because you're now on the, you're on your keyboard and you're not using your mouse as, as much. You're just boom, 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 you're working through your keyboard and your mouse can do a lot more creative things than having to find and click and roam around and do, do different things. So uh, this is where you'll find your camera options and then your shading options. So if, you know, these things look like, the problem is some of this stuff looks like just text. So it might confuse you like, can I click on that? Well, you can actually click on that, you know, because you just, you know, it's, it's actually, in my opinion, a little poorly designed because it doesn't look like something you can click, but you can definitely click those if that's ever confused you or you've ever seen it, you're like, is that clickable or is that just telling me something? Because some of it at the bottom looks like just information and some of it looks like it's clickable. So yes, you can click that, fix your camera uh, settings, perspective, front, left, right, you know. Uh, you've got your camera options here that you can use to select your camera, different things like that. So uh, here is where you would go to do all of that. All right. So manipulating the object. And I'm sorry if I feel like I'm just like kind of pouring all of this information out at you. There's a lot of info in here that needs to get out to you guys as soon as possible. Uh, just so you guys feel more comfortable uh, doing this stuff. So. Uh, bear with me and you know like I said I'm gonna release this video on YouTube so you guys can watch it back probably in slow motion or in slow in slow speed uh, so manipulating the object so to begin editing the primitive click uh, right click on it and hold it the menu that opens will have the options to convert uh, it to an editable poly so if you if you scroll down if you right click on any object there is an option that says convert to and it gives you three different options as of today which is converted to an editable mesh uh, which i've been using more recently than i thought i would ever have to like I'm, I'm using editable mesh more than i usually do because of the line of the work uh, that i do right now uh so the, the second one is your editable poly and then the third one is uh editable patch which till today I've never used. I've literally never converted anything into an editable path. I want to know the people that are converting things to editable paths and what the hell you guys are doing with it. So um, I've never used that before, but those are the three options you have. The one I use the most that I've used the most probably thousands and thousands of times is I've converted things to editable polys. And usually uh, that is sometimes like that's the last thing I do to the model. Uh, because I want to say I've made all the changes that I need to make I've done everything that I could possibly do and now I'm ready to collapse all of that information into my model because a lot of the times I work in layer stacks right so I'll have my cube and then I'll throw an editable poly on top of it so I'm not destroying that layer then I'll add another modifier maybe I'll add an uh, a FFW modifier stack to it or maybe a noise modifier or maybe a normal or UV and I want to be able to go back and edit those things if I need to and I don't want to be strapped down into well you've converted it into an editable poly it's essentially like deleting all the work you've done right and then not being able to go back. So I usually work that way, but that's where you would find those uh, editable poly options. And I've been using editable mesh uh, because I do a lot of architectural stuff and converting it from uh, 3ds Max at, to Lumion or um, Twin Motion, whatever it may be. Those kind of architectural software, those architectural packages, they for some reason prefer editable meshes. Um, and uh, I export as an FBX uh, media and entertainment type, and that usually you know solves whatever shading issues that I think I'm getting in my model. So things like that will definitely like little tips like that. You guys might want to come back to if you ever get into the field and you're doing something and you're like, oh, what's going on with my model? Try an editable mesh if you're getting weird shading issues, right? So these are just little tips that I've run into in the field, passing it on to you guys.
All right. So yeah, if you want, if you you know you've done the unthinkable and you've collapsed your model, you made a cube, you collapsed it, and you're like, oh no, now I need these uh, these stripes on the side, or I need these these edge loops so I can create more detail. And you didn't do it well. There's an option for you. Uh, you've got your selection tools here, where which allows you to shrink, uh, grow, ring, and loop things, right? So you can select uh, you can select your connect option. So you, you would go, you'd right click right here, boom, select these uh, these four lines, and then you'd right click, and then you'd either click on the connect options there, right? If you're looking at my screen right now and you're looking at my cursor, look right over here. So there's a connect button, right? And right beside them, there's an options button. This, this little square right here, that means that has options, an options menu. So if you click on that box, it brings up this little menu right here. And here you can dial in however many you want. But if you just go in, you select those, and you just click the button itself, what it's going to do is it's going to either give you the default or your last used settings, right? And you do, if, you, if that's not what you want, you want to click on those options so you can dial in those settings yourself. So you're going to either have maybe three, and then you can either pinch them, right? Which is you can take all three of those and then either pinch them together or spread them apart. Or, and the next option after that is sliding it around so you can move it and it's usually based on a zero to a hundred scale so you can zero is maybe all the way to the left and a uh, hundred is all the way to the right and that's how that works all right and that's how most of these work they'll have options and some of their options are different back in the day it used to just be a nice little box and sometimes the box would tell you what it is and they try to go with this new fancy schmancy system and the problem with this new fancy system is they're using icons to tell you what text used to do so if you don't know what these icons mean you're just like okay uh what is this supposed to mean but they did do this which was they added a hover option. So if you hover over anything, it's usually going to give you a description of what it is. So um, that's how they kind of try to mitigate that. But they're trying to go simplistic, and I understand it's fancier, it's smoother, it's sleeker. But, uh, you know, sometimes the text helps newbies or new beginners to, uh, to understand the interface just a little bit better and know what's going on. All right. So depending on the part of the poly uh, you are working in, you will have different options in the command panel. With an edge selected, sequential edges can be highlighted by using any of the buttons under the selection tab. All right, uh, Grow and shrink, add or subtract from the current selection. Ring and loop will be useful selection tools as they assist in making and manipulating edge loops. And a lot of things are created with edge loops. Pretty much everything are created with edge loops. All right. So um, when they say ring, right, the ring is across like this, right? So if I selected one, two, three, four, five, I would I could select that all of those in uh, the perpendicular of this, right? Everything that's on the other, you know. Imagine that there was this guy over here, this guy over here. That would be a ring. And the loop is selecting one of these and going following that, uh, that particular line all the way around. So that's a loop, right? And then going across would be ring, right? So those are simple terms that you guys will understand and get better with over time, uh, knowing how they work. All right. So if you select one edge on the cube, when you press the ring button, all parallel edges, not, perp not perpendicular, all parallel edges will be highlighted around the object. With the loop, the loop button will continue the selection of the highlighted edge until the loop angles pass a certain degree. So it just goes all the way around until it's like, oh, okay, you've gotten, you know, you've gotten the entire loop of the object. And it'll follow it until it either terminates or it meets uh, back up to the original uh, starting point. All right. So with a ring uh, of edges selected, the connect tool will create an edge loop 
perpendicular to the ring of selected edges. Just to the right of the connect button is the settings. Pressing the button opens options for creating the loop. The settings from the previous tool usage will be the default. The three sliders allow you to adjust the number of pinch, right? I talked about that already, the pinch and the location of the ring. So you can slide it around, right? Or you can pinch it in or pinch it out or expand it essentially. All right, so making extrusions. Now that the edge loops have been added, they can be used to create windows in our primitive building. This can be accomplished using the bevel and extrude tools. Select each polygon that will allow that will be the window. Be careful that only polygons uh, you have chosen to extrude are selected. And that's this uh, fictitious model that we have here. Right? Extruding faces unintentionally can cause numerous problems as the model gets more complicated. So press the extrude button and bring up the settings, which is that little box in the corner, right? Under the top uh, option, be sure to extrude by polygon, not by group, all right? The option below will determine the depth of the extrusion. So you can go negative, which will push it in, or positive, which will pull it out. All right, now that the window uh, windows are created, repeat the tool to add more unique designs to the building. Modeling can be a bit of trial and error as you discover the best techniques for creating the look of the model. And this is, this is you know, uh, modeling uh, 101. You know, these are, the, we only do this, you know, we only do a certain number of tools to model anything. We only use a certain, you're never gonna understand all of 3ds Max. All you need to really understand are the tools that you need to understand to model what you need to model, right? You don't need to know everything about particles and this, and, no, no. Learn what you need to do the job you, that, that's at hand, right? And you'll be successful. All right. So renders, under the rendering menu, there is the sub menu for environment. In this menu, the background color of your renders can be changed from the default black. And here is where, uh, if you have an environment uh, map that you wanna use, you can toss it in here, and then you can check this button to use the map. I, I rarely use this in exposure control settings right here. Uh, you know, I, well, I think I use, if I do use it, I use linear exposure control and uh, I never use this little render preview just because it's super inaccurate for me and the work that I do to kind of uh, amalgamate the, the amount of sunlight and what the render looks like. So it just, it just never is uh, the best option for me. It's, it, it'd be simpler for me to just render out a small uh, sample, like, you know, 400 by whatever, you know, something like that other than something here that it's not going to be as accurate. And then you can add um, atmosphere. So you can add different things. You can add smoke, fog, different little aspects to it, uh, like a lens flare. You can even add like silhouette, different things like that, or shadow maps and stuff like that in the atmosphere tab. All right. So uh, here is the render panel. Like I said before, this is where you would go to uh, view your last render. If you click on this button right here, it'll render your scene for you. And this guy, right now, it's got a cog wheel thing right there. So that's where you would go if you needed to uh, go into your render settings. And we'll go over more render settings the more you know you guys have things to render. When you guys start having things to render, we'll go more into the rendering aspect of this class. So hopefully you guys are following along. So the render button uh, with the teapot in the top right corner is the render uh, button. Uh, click on this and it will open the render window. Uh, before the image shows up, the render button in the top right corner of this viewport uh, must be clicked as well. Saving the image can be done by clicking the disk icon in the upper left of this menu. So this is the save button right here. 
this right here is the save button. If you know what this is, then you're probably from my generation because it is a floppy disk, right? Uh, and I've given you guys this spiel before. You guys should know what a floppy disk is by now. It's just uh, old school flash drives, right? People used to put games on it. I remember playing Prince of Persia on my floppy disk. So, you know, it's that's, that's all it is. It's a save button. Uh, next to it, I think this is the copy button, and then this is the clone button, and this is the print, and then you can cancel it out. And also, if you're rendering something and you want to cancel the render and you don't want to render it anymore because you've seen something immediately from the first cache or the preview that's wrong, boom, just hit escape. It'll cancel the render for you, and you'll be free to go. Depending on how complex your scene is, though, and if you're using anything on the network, it might take a few moments to do that. So when you hit escape, don't just keep pressing random buttons and just start clicking everywhere because it can really mess up your scene and crash out your entire 3ds max and you'll lose everything and you go mr futai told me to do it no i didn't i said wait be patient if you hit exit or escape wait a second give it some time to do its process and close out whatever it needs to close out all right all right so that is it for uh, this uh, modeling and rendering uh, part one. Uh, next week, I will do the part two of it, and then we'll have another quiz on Friday on those terms as well. Uh, this Friday, uh, we are going to have the quiz, and I'll give you guys a little spiel, and you know we're going to move on from there. All right, so um, yeah, that's going to be it for today's class. I want you guys to study these terms, learn them, get in 3ds Max, um, do your homework from last class because I didn't see a lot of people post. Uh, so please post your stuff, uh, get inside of 3ds Max, start messing around with stuff. I'm telling you guys, fail now, fail, 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 try it and bust your butt, fall down, mess it up, crash Max, do it. If somebody can crash it, you'll get an extra point from me. Right, just click things and figure out what things are. Experiment, explore, right? This is your time to do that. You're in 3D modeling, rendering one. I don't expect y'all to be Paul Papera or Tor Frick with this stuff or Vitaly Bulgarov. I don't expect any of that from you guys. And you guys probably don't even know who those people are. But I expect you guys to try. Right? I expect you guys to at least uh, participate and try and, and, and give it a chance because the worst thing is for you to not give it a chance, fail at it, and then blame 3D or whatever you want to blame or, you know, say, oh, it's my fault for not, no. Try it out. If you don't like it, that's fine. Do it for the grade. Do what you have to do. But I promise you, if you give it a real shot, if you give it a real opportunity, uh, you might learn to love uh, 3D modeling and uh, rendering. All right.